Hey everybody, I'm Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust. And before you watch this Perryville video, we just want to point out that we did have some technical difficulties with our microphone equipment. We are aware of it. We've cleaned up the audio as much as possible and we do apologize in advance, but there is some great content here. We hope that you'll enjoy it and please ignore the bad audio and enjoy the great content with the American Battlefield Trust and our partners at Perryville. Here we are at Perryville again. We're now on the Confederate left, okay? We've really moved along the line today if you're following through our videos. And now here we find ourselves at sort of, you know, uh, along, of course, Doctor's Creek. Uh, this is the creek for which really, in my opinion, the battle starts, right? They could see the sort of shiny pools of water. The battle really is fought over water and terrain, or at least starts over that, right? This creek, you can see it flowing, and it is going to flow down and dump into the Chaplin River right at land that you, the members of the American Battlefield Trust and our supporters, um, have been able to preserve, okay? We have moved over a little bit. We're going to get into that in just a second with Stuart Sanders. We've got a few guests here. Just to show how much into this they really are, all of them are going to come down here. We're all going to take a cup of this algae-ridden, bacteria-ridden water. We're going to drink a little bit to show how into it. You guys ready? Come on. Oh, my God. Mike is actually coming down. He believes me. He's getting ready. He's going to fill up his cup. Please don't. He's calling my bluff, folks. Okay, let's turn around here um, and introduce uh, Stuart Sanders, sometimes known by another name. We'll see um, if that comes out. And he can introduce us to what we're seeing here at the Henry P. Bottom House and bring us up to speed on the battle. Well, this is one of my favorite parts of the Perryville Battle. And, and as, uh, uh, as it's been said, we are now located basically the southern end of where Union General Alexander McCook's Corps was located. And it, again, as the battle began at 2 p.m. on October 8, 1862, First, Confederate General Benjamin F. Benjamin F. Cheatham's division struck the Union left flank. Then Patton Anderson's Confederate division struck the Union center. And now we're dealing with the story of General Simon Bolivar Butner and his Confederates who came here to strike Union troops that were posted on a ridge behind me at that time. So here you have the Henry P. Bottom House. At the time of the battle, Bottom was a 47-year-old farmer, carpenter, justice of the peace who lived there. And on that ridge behind that snake rail fence there were standing members of the 3rd Ohio Infantry Regiment. Now, if you follow me, we'll start heading up the hill. Importantly, down Doctors Creek on the left was the 42nd Indiana Regiment. They were a raw unit. Um, many of the men had never before fired their rifles, and they came down to Doctors Creek to fill up their canteens. All of a sudden, uh, Simon Bolivar Buckner's division, namely a brigade commanded by the Ohio-born uh, General Bushrod Johnson, attacked through these fields drove back parts of the 42nd Indiana and set their sights on the bottom house, but more importantly, the 3rd Ohio Infantry Regiment located on that hill there. Now I'm going to turn it over to Taylor Bishop, who's going to give you some details about the fighting around Henry P. Bottom's house. All right, hi, ladies and gentlemen. So now let's just pretend that we're Bushrod Johnson's men moving through here. You can look up to that ridge right over there. You can see how perfectly the Federals have the field of fire over here. The 3rd Ohio is just having a field day at firing Bushrod, at Bushrod Johnson's men. Now, Bushrod Johnson's men are having to literally just crawl ever so often, trying to get to a stone wall just a little bit over to there. As soon as they get to that stone wall, they're going to start having ammunition shortages, kind of like the same stuff that we saw at Looms' Heights. But they're still going to try to hold on to that ground for as long as they possibly can. Uh, eventually, 3rd Ohio's ammunition is going to start to exhaust. Then the 15th Kentucky, one of the few Kentucky regiments to be out here at Perryville into the thick of the fighting, will move up and replace the 3rd Ohio and begin firing volleys down into Bushrod Johnson's men. By that point, that's when you're going to get the famous Pat Claiborne's brigade starting to move up here. And he, his men have an interesting story. Uh, if you all maybe remember them at Richmond, they actually, uh, after the Battle of Richmond, they captured tons of federal uniforms. And some of those members were wearing those blue uniforms. And as they were advancing through these, like this field right here, their own men from their own artillery started to fire onto them, temporarily halting Claiborne's brigade advancing up to that stone wall. Good. And, and this is interesting. You know what Taylor said here. Here on this place, okay, because we know where it is. There's another place. Let's backtrack because Bushrod Johnson's men are going to sort of fall back a little bit. Let's introduce Micah Trent. I don't have a nickname for him yet, uh, but he's with the Friends of Perryville Battlefield. What's going on with Johnson here? All right, so Johnson, they have ran out of ammunition and, and they're spent. So they get to this wall up here, and so they're going to fall back to this creek bed here where we just came out of there just a few moments ago. This is going to be their spot for the rest of the battle. They will no longer be part of the Battle of Perryville as they have completely wasted ammunition and will now fall back. 
In the meantime, as uh, Taylor mentioned, Claiborne is going to push through Johnson's line, not around. He's going to push through as the second wave to advance the attack on up the hill here. And that's going to cause a little slight issue uh, character-wise with Johnson as he has a small uh, a little beef with uh, Claiborne a little bit later, how he went through it. Now, how he went through, what was said, what was done, I don't know. But that actually uh, will transpire later that night as the armies are falling back because Johnson is going to go look for Claiborne and have a talk with him about what was done. When an aide asked Johnson later, what was it go? How did it, how did it go? What was it about? He said, let us not speak of this no more again. Wow. And, you know, and I think that's interesting because Patrick Claiborne is really thought well thought of today in Civil War circles. Man, he's got the fighting unit. But yet, that doesn't mean he got along with everybody else in the Army. So this is pretty interesting stuff. We're going to be making our way up the hill. And there's a lot developing here. The Claiborne's brigade is not the only one coming in. We're heading toward the bottom house. We're going to do a separate video on that. But let's bring on Colonel Sanders back again. So as Taylor mentioned, the 15th Kentucky Infantry Regiment was posted on that ridge behind me near that snake rail fence. Now, it's important to note that Henry P. Bottom, who lived on this farm, had a large barn located at the end of that fence. And as the fighting was going on, and as the 15th Kentucky was enduring these multiple waves of Confederate assaults, the 5th Company Washington Artillery opened up on their line, and a shell exploded in the barn where many wounded members of the 3rd Ohio and the 15th Kentucky had crawled for protection, and the, bar the barn immediately ignited into flames and burned up. Um, sadly, a number of those wounded Union soldiers perished in the flames. However, as Buckner's men continued this, this fight, as Claiborne moved sort of through the yard of the bottom house, his horse Dixie was shot and killed. Um, another brigade commanded by Brigadier General Daniel W. Adams attacked farther down onto the Confederate left and tried to outflank the Union troops. As Adams rolled into the fight, it was said that a uh, brass band broke loose and filled the woods with music. I'll now turn it over to Taylor, who can tell you about more about the fight around the bottom house. So as Colonel Sanders was mentioning, now we have Adams' brigade starting to move through. Now we have Colonel, uh, now we have Claiborne's brigade moving through. The Federals on top of this ridge over here, and now it's the 15th Kentucky. They are outnumbered extremely bad. Um, their own Colonel, Colonel Pope, is wounded now, and probably one of the most climactic scenes through these fields over here. If you look at that snake oil fence up there, Captain Foreman of the 15th Kentucky is going to pick up the flag and start waving it violently in the air trying to rally his men to continue on to fight but eventually the Confederate pressure is just too much and the entire federal right flank of the first corps is going to collapse and there's going to be mass amounts of confusion all along the line as the, as the federals are going to start trying to retreat back to some of the final lines with what I think we'll touch on. This is great. Well, uh, before we even get to that, I'm going to keep you on here, uh, Fighting Bishop, because here we, we now have the view from what I think. I mean, I don't know a lot, but I think Adams is coming from over there. Yeah. So could you describe some of that action for the camera so they can understand this a little bit better? Because it seems consequential. So imagine you're one of the Federals on top of the ridge up above. You're trying to focus down at the Confederates where we're at over here. All of a sudden, you just see an entire huge brigade of losing in. It's popping out over through here and just smashing right into to the right, federal right flank of the 15th Kentucky. There's nothing that they can really do about it. It just steamrolls everything all throughout here. All those Confederates realize that Adams' brigade is about to hit the federal right flank, and so they get their morale up and going, and they move forward again. It's just massive amounts of mass communication, uh, confusion all along the federal line. It's crazy. So. Here comes the Colonel, actually. <laughs> well, as Taylor mentioned, the 15th Kentucky was commanded by Colonel Kern Pope who's from one of Louisville's most prominent families. Now, this is where the drought that had taken place in October 1862 takes on great significance. Uh, most creeks and streams here were dry. It hadn't rained in weeks and weeks. Soldiers were forced to drink out of pools of stagnant algae-covered ponds. Well, this, of course, led to disease in the Army. And current Pope, who'd been wounded in the arm, just only suffered a slight wound that he said was in the fleshy part of his arm. However, several weeks after the battle, he actually had contracted um, typhoid, and ended up dying of typhoid fever in Danville, Kentucky, 10 miles to our east. So even though Pope was wounded at Perryville, and even though he uh, uh, survived the battle and survived that wound, he ended up probably drinking fetid and polluted water and ended up dying from the sort of waterborne illness that ended up killing him. That happened to hundreds and hundreds of soldiers um, during the Kentucky campaign. You know, as we know, most soldiers died of either um, illness or disease, and that certainly held true during this campaign as well.
That's great. You know, despite that story uh, that he was just telling about, about the stagnant pools of water and the typhoid, I had just asked Micah off camera whether he was really going to drink the water of Doctor's Creek, and he said yes, and that I respect. Now, I don't know how long he's going to live, but that I respect, you know. And if I may, you know, this is kind of cool, you know. I never really realized this off camera. We have a lot of cool talks off camera um, here. Uh, if you can see the most distant tr uh, ridge over there, correct me if I'm wrong, Micah, but he just said that, I mean, there's a separate part of the battle where you have a skeletal Union force, uh, I'm sorry, Confederate force, holding back, sort of holding against Phil Sheridan, really Gilbert. You're holding against the sort of uh, the, the temperament of Gilbert. And a huge force potentially could be coming down toward Perryville. Very few Confederates are there. And F Philip Henry Sheridan's ready to get into battle. So he actually appears on that hillside that you can see. He is over on this hillside, and he has orders to do nothing. He has something to sit there and watch. And if you know Sheridan and you followed to his history, he can't sit still. And then when he gets here, he can't sit still. And so he tells us boys to dig in. And so uh, they're going to be firing at the Confederates from that side. But Sheridan does not move. Could you just imagine what a difference it can make, especially a fighting brigade? you know, showing up and being able to really move. Unless he even has a division here, I forget. Uh, don't don't judge me, okay? Um, but let's take a few more steps closer to the wall, and I'll ask Stuart to come back to wrap this up. What I'd like to say, see here is the Union falls back. The Confederates are going to pursue. They're ready, flush with victory, right? But I can't see over that ridge. I doubt the Southerners have any idea what's going on up there. And we're, of course, going to shoot a different video up there. But let me tell you, it's going to be bloody. It's a place called the Slaughter Pen. But let's wrap up this part first. Well, like Bushrod Johnson's brigade, we've only reached the stone wall. This is where we're going to stop. We want to tell you about how the rest of the battle unfolded on the Union right. As the 15th Kentucky Infantry peeled away, that basically forced uh, Brigadier General William Lytle's brigade to also fall back on the Union center. Lytle was actually wounded. He was captured. He was taken 10 miles away to Harrodsburg, Kentucky. And basically what happened is you had uh, uh, Major General uh, Simon Bolivar Buckner, mass Confederate artillery, um, you know, a few hundred yards behind us, and again, pounding the Union lines, and that ended up sort of pushing back the entire Union right flank. And both flanks of the Union Army began to collapse back toward what we call the Dixville Crossroads. And after four or five hours of savage fighting, more than 7,500 men were killed and wounded, and that's where the Battle of Perry will end. Good, good. Uh, thanks to Taylor, thanks to Micah, thanks to uh, Stuart, thanks to Chris White behind the camera, and to all of you for watching. We're having a great day here at Perryville. We hope you enjoy, and we hope you are uh, getting ready to uh, consider supporting the American Battlefield Trust if you don't already, and of course the Friends of Perryville. You can see the great work that they do all around us. Thanks for your support.